Um, I sound like I'm in a well again, and we're in Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 1. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication and has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. Then a, a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Lord, we thank you once again for your word. We pray your blessing now on us as we listen, as we seek to understand, and that we would believe it and, and be doers of it. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I, I went on a missions trip, it was like, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago to Ecuador, and on the way in, it was one of those deals where we had to circle around for a while because it was, uh, there wasn't m minimum visibility, so that's nerve-wracking because you're like, I don't like the sound of minimum, vis I don't want to land in minimum dis uh, visibility, I want to land in maximum visibility, and it's like this crazy airport coming in and like the, the Andes Mountains and like got to come in real steep anyway and they you know we probably circled if I think it was probably like 45 minutes it felt like forever and they finally said okay we've reached minimum visibility we're cleared to land and I'm like <laughs> and you're looking out the window and you're like there's nothing you can see nothing and you're like and you know we've been descending for a while now like are we going to see anything ever and it was it was just scary I hate flying already and finally the clouds broke and you could see, and it felt like it was like two seconds later that we hit the ground. I'm like, that was crazy minimum visibility. Going through chapter 6 through 9 through 18 has felt like that. And now we get to chapter 19 and it just brightens up. So it's been, hasn't it been, it's been grueling going through these chapters. You know, this, all this judgment all these terrible things in, uh, especially the last couple chapters, um, the, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments, Babylon, all of that. Now we're, we've broke through all that as it were, and we get to this place of uh, great praise from heaven. And, and, it, and we're gonna see in the chapter, not only do we see heaven worshiping and praising, but we see and hear heaven calling for worship and praise. The, the word alleluia, we just read it four times. This is the only top four times in the whole New Testament that that word is used. It's a, a, a Greek transliteration of the Hebrew word hallelujah, uh, and they mean praise God or praise Jehovah, praise Yahweh. And so this passage is both a, a declaration, you know, praising God, but it's also, the way it's worded, the, the word is also an imperative. It's an urge to do it. It's an urging, an exhortation to praise God. And then in addition to that, we have a couple other phrases. Verse 5 is, 
another call to, it says, praise our God. And then in verse 7, there's another call to give him glory. And so this passage is both heaven worshiping, but also heaven exhorting us to worship. And, and it's given by, when we read through the passage, we see that this urging, this call to worship is given by everyone there. Everyone at different points there has an opportunity and says, we have the tribulation saints calling us to worship. We have the, the redeemed church calling us to worship. We have the angelic hosts and the four living creatures. And, and even God himself in verse 5 calls us to worship. Everybody there is not only worshiping, but saying, calling us to do it. And and uh, clearly, heaven thinks that worshiping God is a really good idea. And, and heaven not only calls us to, but, but heaven also responds to the call to do it. Because one group calls for worship, and the rest of everybody else there doesn't go, really, right now? No, they, they, every time it's said, it, they join in. And so may it be like that in the church on earth. May we be like that. And so let's dig in. Verse 1 says, After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her, And again, they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. So right away we see that this happens after the the judgment of of Babylon, uh, which we've been studying the last couple, uh, two or three weeks. The the world of false religion, the world of idolatrous commercialism, it's been crushed at this point. And, And as we saw in chapter 18, the kings of the earth, the merchants of the earth, they're distraught over this. They see the, the crushing, the falling of Babylon, and, and they're, just, they're just besides themselves. But here we see heaven has a completely different response. They erupt in worship in response to that happening. And, and, and we see every type of, as we read through the passage, every, every type of living being in that God's throne area is excited, joins in the worship, and, and is thrilled. It, I, I was reading it, and it reminded me of, uh, this is my mind, The Wizard of Oz, when uh, Dorothy's house landed on the Wicked Witch, and, and then all of Munchkin land, you know, erupts in celebration, and even all the different groups have a song for it, the, the Lollipop Guild, the Lullaby League, all of them have a song, and I kind of see it like that. They're just so excited. Something really good has happened. Some, uh, an element of evil that has tormented people and, and has angered God for so long is finally destroyed, and, and they're thrilled. And, and they begin with that word, alleluia, as we pointed out. But then they, it, it, it's not just a bunch of praise God, praise God, praise God, mixed within all of those uh, declarations and in calls to worship is why why should we praise God and they got plenty of reasons we have plenty of reasons he starts it starts out by saying they say salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God that's why and and now this is cool because this is not only good worship this is really good doctrine right here and and worship should have good doctrine um, but it's encouraging And it's even more than, I think it's even more encouraging than our translation uh, has it because in, before each of these words, salvation, glory, honor, and power, there's a definite article in the original Greek. It's the, and it means the only. So the only salvation belongs to God. The only true glory is his. The only real honor belongs to God. And the only actual power is God. That, that's what it says literally. And so the, the heavenly chorus is praising God for these things. And, and if, those are things, if those things aren't something that anyone could be praising God for, I don't know what is. What could we, if, if we can't praise God for that, the fact that these are his, I don't know what we could be worshiping for. Think about them. God alone has salvation. No one else 
has salvation. And, and, th- and, and he has it. And what does he do with it? What does God do with salvation? He gives it away for free. He saves. Our God saves. He saves sinners. He saves people that need saving. Imagine if if someone else did have salvation. Imagine, just think of anybody in the world. What would they do with it? They'd probably sell it, market it for a really high price. Maybe even put you on a subscription plan as long as you keep your subscription, you know, up to date. Hey, you know, and send you the reminder notice you're about to go to hell. You didn't keep up with your, your you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. And, or maybe they'd only make it available to certain people who agreed with them on everything and, and certain issues. Or, or they'd hoard it, you know, or, or they'd do terrible things with it. But our God has salvation and he gives it away for free. He offers it to anyone who wants it for free. And and heaven sees that and goes, man, if we can't praise God for that, I don't know what to praise God for. Praise God that he has salvation, and he gives it away. And then, or, or imagine if someone else had the glory and honor that only God has. It's already gross when you encounter an arrogant person who thinks they're glorious and, and has honor. And there's plenty of people like that. You know, and we imagine, we can't even fathom how terrible it would be if somebody, if some sinner somehow managed to have actual glory and honor. That would be horrible. Or, or power. God alone has the true and ultimate power. And, and again, once again, if anyone in this world, if anyone else had it, it would be a terrifying prospect. Um, Psalm 2, it says, The nations rage. They plot, a, a, they plot the vain thing of saying we're going to, we're going to uh, uh, set ourselves against the Lord and against his anointed. And, and, and the nations do that without any real power compared to God's power. And, and, the, and it says in that psalm that the Lord laughs because he actually does have power. So they're, you know, it's like a bunch of ants going, waving their fists at us, going, we're going to get you. And you're like, you know. And, and, and you know, once in a while you, we read... The news likes to keep us in constant panic, doesn't it? And uh, once in a while, you read some news report of some, you know, one of our political enemies, you know, China or Russia. The governments there, not the people, of course, in case we know that, right? We know that. The governments. And, and maybe we read some story about some new scary weapon that they have, and, and uh, you know, our government's at odds with their government, so it's concerning. We want, we want power to be on our side in that scenario. And we want the balance of power to favor us. Look, we can be glad that our enemy or our enemies don't have the power. God has the power. He does. And, 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 but what if they did? Imagine if they did. What if the Antichrist, he's going to come along someday. He's going to rise up. He doesn't have the power. And and it would be a terrifying thought if he did. God has the power. And God has the power with the salvation and with the honor and with the glory and with the grace and with the love and with the mercy. He has all that. And and so uh, praise him that he has that. Praise God that I don't have the power. Praise God that you don't have the power. We like to act like we do. But praise God we don't. And, and, and then we're also exhorted here to praise him because of what he's, what, he ha- what he's done. At this point in the story, it says he has judged the great harlot. It's done at this point. He has avenged her blood, uh, her, the blood of, uh, her blood on, of, that she shed of, of God's servants. And, and here's, here's something else to put together that's important to see. It's one thing to have power and glory and salvation. But to have that and still to be threatened by an enemy, it's not enough, right? And that's how we live right now. That's how we live right now. God has all these things. God is all these things. But we, right now, presently, still contend with the world, 
the flesh, and the devil. They're all against us. They're all against God's best for us. But when this happens, when, when chapter 19 happens and this heavenly chorus erupts, there, that happens when the world will have just seen the world system, Babylon, this great enemy, defeated forever. All her corruption, all her spiritual lies, all her poisonous immorality will be gone. All the persecution that she unleashed uh, uh, against God's people will have been avenged, and it will have happened once and for all, never to come back, ever. You ever had a gopher or a mole in your yard? Isn't it? Ugh. You know that game Whack-A-Mole? There's truth to that game. That's why it's so funny, because you, you whack it here, and he just pops up over here, and you whack it here, and he pops up over That's what those things do. And it seems like they always know when you just got your lawn all looking good or your garden or whatever, and, and, they, and they, they just keep popping back up. Throughout history, throughout our lives, Babylon has been like that. Babylon, again, as a system and, and a place and a people and an idea, it just pops up all over the place. It makes new holes. It causes new destruction. And so these words are extremely exciting. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. That's all that comes up of her anymore. No more destruction. Now it's just the smoke of her burning. In other words, she's not coming back. She's good and gone. And as a side note, this is another reason, and I think there's a ton of reasons why I don't think the harlot is just a city. Because it, a, a city can only burn for so long. But uh, eternal judgment of souls, that is, that is something that keeps going on eternally. And, and, it's, and so there, here's a, just another picture of that. Now, this call for praise regarding Babylon, of course, it's after it's judged. And, but we need to know that God wants us to see that now. He put it in his word for us now. He put it in his word from the beginning of the church, from the early church, and he wanted every generation of his church to see this is the outcome. And, and, and he wants us to know that now. And for a very good reason. Little kid goes into the doctor and he's scared. He's really scared. He's scared of going to the doctor. What's he going to do to me? And so you point out to another kid who just walks out and he's got a lollipop in his hand and he's fine. He's not dead. The doctor didn't, the doctor didn't kill that kid. You're going to go in there. You're going to come out and you're going to have a lollipop. And, and God is showing us the outcome sort of like that. He shows us the outcome of this wicked world system that it's going to come down. That the God who has all and is all is going to see to that. And, and when it does, we're going to get more than lollipops. We're going to get way more than that. Heaven's going to rejoice. And, and what has been promised throughout uh, the history of God's people will be fulfilled. It will actually be done. Jesus said of himself, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning of the, and the end. And so... Yeah, they're rejoicing uh, because it has been done, but we can rightly rejoice because it will be done. Because the one who is the Alpha and the Omega told us it will. And so, um, and not only that, but this is just chapter 19. We got the rest of the rest of the book's awesome. The rest of the book is good. Verse 4. And then it says, And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. So here we see a couple of groups that we haven't seen since way back in chapter 6 and 7. We have the, the, 24, the 24 elders around God's throne and the, and the four living uh, creatures that are around God's throne. And... And when they hear this eruption of worship by this great multitude, their response is, amen, hallelujah. And amen means, yeah, we agree. Yes, so be it. When you hear somebody say amen around you, they're just, that's what they're saying. They're saying, yes, I agree. That's what it means. 
And, and so that's what these guys are saying. They're saying, yes. And then they also say, they add to it, hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. You say hallelujah. So do I. I agree. And, and so they hear this call to worship, and they couldn't agree more. And not only agree, but they join in. They don't just agree. They join in. They think it's a good idea to, to not just agree, but to take part as well. Now, we, we said in an earlier study that this great multitude uh, is likely the tribulation saints. These are people that uh, come to faith during the tribulation, and they die through, throughout the tribulation, whether it be of martyrdom or some other way, and they make it there. And then we, we also said that the 24 elders are uh, probably representative of uh, God's people, uh, both Old and New Testament, that you know went before. And then, of course, we have the four living creatures, and they are just the four living creatures. That's what they are. And so it's interesting. So I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, in terms of seniority, if there, however, however seniority works in heaven, this multitude who started this round of worship, they, they're, they're the, they have the least seniority, as it were, in heaven. They've been there the least amount of time. And yet, they're the ones that start this round of, the, or this, cor- this eruption of worship. And, and the cool thing is, is that no one in heaven is bothered or put out that the newbies are, you know, calling a time of worship. Nobody is uh, uh, put out by that. Everyone thinks it's a great idea. And so much so that they join in too. Even though... They've been around much longer. I mean, how long have the four living creatures been there? They don't look at these uh, guys and go, well, these guys think they are calling a worship session. They're like, oh, you guys want to worship? Yeah, that's what we're all about. And, 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 um, and then it doesn't even stop there because notice another, another uh, something, someone else joins in. It says, notice a voice from the throne spoke saying, praise our God, all you his servants and, and those who fear him, both small and great. So here's this voice coming from the throne. Well, who's on the throne? Who's there? It's, it's God. Is this God the Father, God the Son? I don't know. It's God. And, and the point is, these, you know, tribulation saints, they start calling for everyone to worship. Everybody else joins in. And God, who's in charge of the whole place, doesn't go, hey, wait a minute, you didn't ask if you could worship. He just goes, yeah, worship, that's good, I like it. And, and he says, and he, he says, yeah, everyone. Notice how he says it? Oh, um, all you, his servants, all y'all, every one of you. The, the small, the great, people that everyone knows, nobody knows you, doesn't matter, just join in. And worship, and guess what? They do, and and uh, they just worship him. When I read that, I go, I wish it was more like that here. Now, it doesn't always go like that here now, does it? Some people seem to get put out by worship sometimes. Some people skip it. <sighs> ah, it's okay if we make it by the time the sermon starts. Look, can I encourage you? When we have songs and singing at the beginning of the service, that's not like just your buffer zone to get to church. It's not. And I don't want anyone to feel bad. I just am trying to encourage you. This is a huge part of what we are doing here on Sunday. It's a huge part of it. It's getting our hearts ready. It's getting our minds ready. It's not the, it's not the warm-up time the entry music, it's part of our worship, the whole thing. And, and uh, you know, or, or sometimes people like, oh, the music's too loud, or I don't like this song. Others can distract, can be the one that distracts from worship. You know, where they're the ones, sometimes people want to sing louder than everybody else, or, or they want to sing differently, they want to add their own little, and that, be careful of that, too, because the, the tension is supposed to be on God. And whether you mean to or not, if you start doing that, you're going to make the attention be on you. But, but here's how it goes in heaven. Here's what heaven thinks. Is it right to worship? Everyone there thinks so. 
Are the words of the worship good to say? Everyone there thinks so. Is the timing right? Is it the right time to worship? Well, they obviously think so. They all join in. And they don't care if it was the newbies or the person that's been there the longest who, who uh, started it. And, and so for us, we can follow that example. Is the timing right? Well, let me think. Sunday morning, church, we're all together here for Jesus. Is this the right time to worship? I think so. You know? What about the words? Nobody has ever come up to me and went, I'm, I'm, I can't sing to that song because I don't agree with those words. If we ever had a song like that, I would want to be made aware of it. But if the words are and the words are the most important part of the song, not the style. I don't like that style. Too many drums in that song. I'm so glad we have drums again. Oh. And is it right to do so? I don't know. Is he God or is he not God? Is he worthy or is he not worthy? That's all that's needed. That's it. And, and so when that happens, that, let's follow heaven's example. Let's join in. Let's praise him. And, and listen, corporate worship, which is another way of saying group worship, where we're all worshiping together. I know it's not the only kind of worship. I know that you can worship anytime, anywhere, all alone, by yourself. But here's the thing. There's something sweet about cor corporate worship because it is limited in how often you can do it. Most of you go to work, and you're probably not getting corporate worship at work. But we're always going to have it here. We're going to have it here. Join in. There's something about it. There's something different when you're around all the people of God and you're together, and we're all in agreement, and we're all glad to be doing what we wouldn't do any, you know, you're some people will, and that's awesome, but you're not going to just go to the grocery store and be in the long checkout line and go, hey, while we're waiting in this line, why don't we sing some choruses and praise to God? You're not. It'd be pr pretty cool if you did, but, but here we do. And so because it's limited, man, take advantage of it. Don't miss out on it. Join in. Worship together. And, and, and in heaven, the things that hinder us, in regards to this kind of thing, they don't get hindered by that kind of thing there. When someone wants to worship, everybody's in. And, and again, it doesn't matter how long they've been there or not. And, and so let's be like that. If, if, if you're not able to do that, can I recommend being concerned? <laughs> if you're at church where it's completely normal and comfortable and it's why we're here and you're not able to sing out loud and we're not asking you to come up and lead you're just you're just even in that scenario afraid or timid to sing these things to god i i think you ought to be concerned about that i think ask god to i don't know reveal what the problem is because he's worthy, it's good, it's right, and there's no reason not to join in. Um, one other thing here is, it, listen, again, the voice from the throne, all you servants, praise our God. I think sometimes people will maybe think or say, just not feeling it right. I've heard that. I've probably thought it myself. What? does that have to do with anything? That, that thought or statement reveals a very poor understanding of worship. Jesus said, worship in spirit and in truth. He didn't say, make sure you're feeling it before you start singing to the Lord. We're, we're exhorted to worship God, every one of us, and worship is about him. It's not about us. It's about him, the one who loves us and called us and does so much for us and has been faithful to us, and he's with you just as he promised. He's going to do great things. Fix your eyes on him. Worship him. He's worthy of it. We need to. Verse 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters 
and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. So here, the multitude started it. Everybody joined in. Now the multitude has something else to say. And, and, and it says this time, they they're say it with like an overwhelming, powerful loudness, like a great waterfall or like thunder. And this time, another reason, it's uh, for his, God's power and authority. Omnipotent means all power. Complete, utter, absolute, limitless power. That's God. That's the kind of power he has. And then, of course, the word reign means uh, sovereign authority, absolute authority. And so it means God is on the throne. That's why we should worship him, because he's on the throne, and he isn't about to be removed. He's not threatened. God is in control. He always has been. He always will be. Um, he's sovereign. He knows everything that's going on. The Bible says that not one hair of your, one, not one of your hairs falls to the ground without his notice. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. I'm glad I don't notice every hair that falls out of my head. But God rules with absolute, unchallenged power and authority. And, and what's so amazing about this and why that's such a sweet thought is in light of all that we've been reading and in light of all that John has been seeing and in light of all that heaven has been know, knowing that's gone, unfolding up to this point in the story, because during that, all of that, if there was ever a time that it seemed like he wasn't on the throne, it was then. You know, a lot of times you can look around the world and go, it doesn't seem like he's on the throne. It, it almost seems like evil reigns. But here, when evil reaches its greatest, most terrible effect, it becomes crystal clear, yeah, God reigns. And, and the Antichrist doesn't reign. And the, uh, the false prophet doesn't reign. And uh, Babylon the Great, the harlot, doesn't reign. And, and the, you know, the, the media doesn't reign. And the halls of academia don't reign. And the government doesn't reign. And the, that party doesn't reign. And that party doesn't reign. God reigns. And how freeing and relieving it is when we really believe that. You want to be free? You want to have peace? Remember that God reigns. You ever heard that saying, not my circus, not my monkeys? The idea being all kinds of craziness is going on and and it kind of gets to you, and then you realize, wait a minute, this is not my mess. I did not do this. I don't like it, but this is not my problem. And, and it's good when you can get to that place. And, and we live in a, it, it, what's really interesting is that's, that's a good idea, because we live in a time where the average individual, it's crazy the time we live in, the average individual right now has more information about more things than world empires did, you know, 500 years ago. We know the end of it, just get it out on your phone. You can know whatever you want to know and, 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 and not be able to do anything about it. And, and who knows if what you're knowing is even accurate at all, right? But we have the information, and it can be overwhelming to us. Sometimes you know all this stuff, and it's, the, I know the media and people that sell things want you to feel like it is all your problem, you know, but it's good to remember, not my circus, not my monkeys. Not everything's my problem. I'm not in charge. I didn't do that. But, but as relieving as that can be, it's really not enough to have real peace. But here's what is. The Lord God omnipotent reigns. He's got a handle on it. He's got an answer for it. He knows what he's going to do. He knows how to straighten it all out. So praise him for that. He's in control. He reigns. If everything was in our hands, yeah, we should be panicked every second of the day, every last second. Imagine if the outlook, outcome of the book of Revelation was on believers, like if the believers had to sort it all out. It'd be over. But, but we can be thrilled because that's not how it is. God reigns. There's a lot of stuff where that's a good deal. You know, we have a lot of muscles. We have voluntary muscles where you are the one that moves them, right? You have to make yourself eat. You can't, you know. But there's other ones, and we're really glad they are, 
that they're involuntary, and that means God has them. It's really good that you don't have to think about breathing all the time. God's got that. Otherwise, we'd wake up dead every morning. You know, it's good. That was a joke. You don't have to think that too, too much. Woke up, wake up in the morning. Man, I forgot to breathe again last night. I hate when that happens. Sleep apnea, actually, so then, then anyway. But, but imagine if you did have to handle those types of things. It would be terrible. Imagine if we had to be in, you know, we know when the sunset, right? We got all the, you know, we can look it up. And when's the sun, sunrise today? What's the sunset? Or we look at the weather forecast. We know all these things. We can't, we can't do anything about it. And, and uh, we can praise God for that. As crazy as this world is, as insane as godlessness has become, here's something we can get behind and every single one of us should. Praise God that he reigns. He does. He takes all these things as his problem. He does. And think about it. God said, cast all your cares on me. He didn't go, cast all your cares on me, but I'm going to make you worry about the sunrise and the sunset and, you know, what's going on in every part of the world. And I, He didn't do that. He said, cast all your cares on me. I already got control of everything else. I'm already, I'm already there. And so he wants to reign in our lives. He wants us to focus on the fact that he reigns over the big stuff, but even our individual lives. He wants to reign in your marriage. He wants to reign in your finances. He wants to reign in what you do day to day, in your job, in your free time, in your future, in your outlook, in your thoughts. And if we let him, we'll be able to praise him more. Verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the lin fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So they, they continue worshiping here, saying, let's be glad and rejoice. And when it says let's, it's like, come on, let's do this. This is awesome. He's full of glory, man. Let's, let's rejoice in him. And, and then they give another reason for worship, because the marriage of the Lamb has come. So what's that? In, in the New Testament, the church is called the Bride of Christ. Now, right now, presently, the church is the betrothed bride. Betrothal was like engagement, only more binding than our engagement. When you were betrothed in that time, you, you couldn't just break it off. It, to break it off would to be uh, the equivalent, uh, the same as getting divorced. It was just as binding in their minds. The only thing that was different is you hadn't consummated the relationship yet. And so during that time, the bride would wait for her groom, keep herself unto him, keep herself only for him, and he would come and take her home. And then that would be solidified, the whole, whole thing. And so that's, that's what this is talking about, the, because the church is likened to the bride of Christ. And it, so it's a vision of the day when, when Jesus comes and the bride is finally home with him forever, never to be apart from him again. And it says, uh, let's praise him for that. That day's coming. And it says his wife has made herself ready. It says she's dressed in pure, pure white, representing her uh, righteous deeds. And, and, and so there's this exhortation in heaven to each other. Let's rejoice about this. We're ready. We get to be with him. And, and, and so this is awesome. Who wouldn't? Rejoice at that moment. I can't fathom a single person who's going to be there going, okay, that's cool, but can we do something? Everyone's going to rejoice about that. Now, we read this, and we're not there yet. And we might think, well, sure, they rejoice about that, but if I were in their shoes, I'd be rejoicing too. But right now, I'm still living in this crazy, mixed-up world. I still have bills to pay. I still have to get in my car and sit in traffic tomorrow. I still have to deal with this and that. I still have the kids. The house is a mess. You know, I have stress to handle all kinds of things. It's hard to rejoice in the midst of all this. But that's the very reason why we're shown this in advance. Because this is not some 
abstract possible outcome for our future. This is, this is the certain promised future that God has told his people. If you're a Christian, this is your future. If you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you will be there. You'll be there. It's interesting when you think of it that way, because it's almost like reading this is like watching a, a video of the future sent back in time for us to go, here's what's going to happen. It makes you think that uh, back to the future when he sent back that sports almanac. It's like that, but way better. You know, and, and we can look at this scene and say, the marriage of the Lamb, I'm going to be there. And, and I'm going to be ready. It says they're ready. I'm going to be clothed in white robes. I'm going to be there because of Jesus. And, and that's supposed to lighten any heaviness in our heart. That's why he told it to us in advance. He knows the heaviness and the difficulties and the things that cause us sorrow right now. And he said, hold on to this. Keep your eye. This is where you're headed. And, and be glad. It's like when you're going on vacation. You think of it. There, we, we, uh, we have a vacation plan for our 25th anniversary coming up in the fall. And we, it was one thing, and, but then we booked our, we got our tickets. We booked the flight. And then it became more exciting. So now we're looking at hotels and stuff. And, but it's like having it in hand. And this is... This passage in the rest of Revelation is like the ultimate ticket in hand for, for believers, that we have the greatest future in store for us. That, okay, fine, we can't rejoice about what's going on right now. And a lot of times that's the case. But, but I, I, have, I have my place in heaven because of Jesus, where I'll be with him forever. I'll be clothed in righteousness. I won't have to sit there and contend with my flesh that wants to sin. I'll be with him. Rejoice. Be glad. And then verse 9, he said, then he said to me, Write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Now, it's interesting that he says he's told to write this because he's supposed to be writing everything that he saw. That's what it said at the beginning of the book. You're going to you know, write the things you see, the things that are, and the things that will take place after these things. So he was already given that instruction. But, but, so the fact that he's being told to write this is like, if you're going to miss anything, don't miss this part. Don't miss this. It's just, you know, he knows John's human. He, he's being guided by the Holy Spirit. He's supernaturally being guided in all this, but, he, but he's just emphasizing this is so important. Blessed are those who are called to this marriage supper. And then he said, these are the true sayings of God. Don't you love weddings? Weddings are still some of the best parties you can go to. Weddings are awesome, and they should be, you know, because you're focusing on, you're, we're, here's a, a man and a woman that are they're joining together for the rest of their lives as a picture of the way God is with his people. It's, a, it's an awesome thing. Celebration's great. Families joining together, all this kind of cool stuff. And, it, and it's great. And he said, blessed are those who, who are called to the marriage supper of them. If weddings are awesome, this is going to be the, if a wedding party is awesome, this is going to be the greatest party that's ever happened. Right there. That's it. And we're going to celebrate and we're going to rejoice. And, and he says, and I want you to know, these are the true sayings of God. I want you to be absolutely clear. This is God's word. We have God's word on this. This isn't some exaggeration. This isn't just some wishful thinking. This is God saying this. He's the one calling this party. He's the one instituting this celebration. If a person can get excited about a political promise, if a person can get excited about some forecast in the stock market or, or the weather, or how much more should we be able to get excited about this? The one who can't lie says, here's what's happening. And, and we could, should sing hallelujah regarding it. That we're, we're going to have a home with him for all of eternity. Everything's cleared up. All that no visibility, all that nastiness, it's all clear. In the light of Jesus, we're going to be with him. And if you haven't received him yet, you don't know for sure you're going to be there. But you can 
trust Jesus. Verse 10, and I fell on his, at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So I, I imagine John, like us, we're glad we got past chapter 18, and now that he's seeing all this, he's totally overwhelmed at this revelation that he's receiving. And he's so excited, he's so moved, that he just falls on his face in adoration. And, and so that's what he wants to do. He does that. And he does it right there before the angel who's showing him all this stuff and giving him this message. He starts to worship him. And the angel goes, man, don't do that. I, I, think, I think the angel was probably nervous God hates idolatry. He hates it anywhere. He hates it here on earth. Imagine trying to do that in heaven. He's like, dude, you're going to get us in trouble. Stop. They don't do that around here. You guys do all kinds of crazy idolatry on earth, not up here. So he says, don't do it. I'm just a servant like you. I'm just a messenger telling you about Jesus. And here's the deal. Everything that I've shown you is meant to point you to Jesus. It's meant to lead you to worship God. That's what all prophecy is for. It's meant to point us to Jesus. Every bit of it, the good and the bad, every chapter of Revelation is meant to point us to Jesus. All the wrath and all the good stuff. This, the, the marriage to all of it, it's about Jesus. That's what prophecy is about. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Prophecy is given so that we'll know him better. And, and that we'll be more amazed and more impressed by him. We're not supposed to read the Bible and be, and be primarily be impressed by all the events and activities and, wow, that's going to be crazy and all that kind of stuff. And, and we're also certainly not meant to, to read and study these things only to be amazed by the messenger, which is what happened with John here. It's to make us more amazed and in awe and in love of Jesus. To, to want to know him better. So John's half right here. He's half right to be amazed and want to fall on his face, but not to do that before the messenger. You know, kids know how this works. Every, on, on Christmas morning, the kid gets up and he, he's all excited about all the presents that he sees under the tree. He doesn't care about the wrapping. He's not going, man, mom, you just outdid yourself this year with those ribbons. I'm just so, I can't even, I don't want to, oh, they're so perfect. No, they don't care. They don't care if it's in a, they don't care if it's in the best wrapping you've ever seen. They don't care if it's in a paper sack. They, they, want, the, they want what's in it. They, that's what they're excited about. And, and in a sense, the, the servants or the messengers of God, we're just wrapping. You know, some are fancier. You know, some are like old paper sacks or, you know, you ever wrap something in the comics from the new, do they even have that anymore? But, but it's nothing without the wrapping, without the, the message. And some people spend far too much time and pay too much attention to the packaging, delivery, personality, the appearance of the messenger. Are they cool or not? You know, and, and they say, whether it was good or bad based on those things. Some bow down even, as it were, to the, the package of it all. And, and they're missing the substance. Or they don't care if the substance is good because they like the package so much. And, and be careful of that. We have to be careful of that. If we're getting all excited about the outward trappings, you know, the message is supposed to point us to Jesus. That's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to make us want more of him and be more in uh, submitted and surrendered and loving him. And if you find it doing anything else, if we listen or watch or hear and we're more impressed with the presentation or the person or, or if you can, I can only listen to this teacher. I, don't, I can only listen to 
this person's teaching. I can only worship when it's this type or that song. Then you were wrong on that. And, and, and the, listen to what is said here, because God would say the same thing to us. He would say to that attitude in us, see that you don't do that. Don't be all impressed with the messenger. Don't be all impressed with the style, the package. Worship God. And, and, and then make sure that it's not the package that's somehow drawing us away from the worship of God. And if it's not, that's okay. If it is, get away from that package. And if it's, and if, if it's not the package, make sure it's not our own heart. I'm focusing wrong. I'm putting something on a pedestal that shouldn't be there. God needs to be in that place. He needs to have the highest place in my heart and my mind. And, and I want you to know that's our purpose here, by the way. I'm so glad we have a, some drums again. We missed that. And I, I, I'm enjoying this uh, new season of worship we're having at our church. But it's not about that. It's not. You know? Sometimes you go to a church that's got an amazing building, and it's cool. Why not? Hey. You know, they're able to have different things. That's not the focus. And if, it's ever, if it ever becomes the focus, either check your heart or check what's going on there, and then adjust properly. See that you don't do that. Worship God. Every sermon we preach here, every Bible study, every time of worship, every fellowship event, every meal we have together, it's meant to draw us closer to the Lord. That's what it's for. Not to just be focused on those things. These are all just tools. We want, we want every one of you to grow in the Lord, to know Jesus better, to love him more. We, everything that we do here, we're not perfect at the way we do it, but everything that we do here, that's the purpose. That's the goal, to worship him to not make it about the package, but to make it about Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for this new section of Revelation. And we know that we're going to be there. And we praise you, Lord. And we, we say hallelujah to you. Praise the Lord all that we're headed for, that all that's in store for us after the darkness, after everything clears up, that's what you have in store for us. Help us to trust you. We pray once again, if there's anyone here that has never made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ as Lord, they haven't, they don't know they're forgiven yet, they don't know they're going to heaven, that they could do that right now. They can know that they can receive you simply by turning in their hearts away from their sin and saying to you, Lord, I'm a sinner. Save me. Jesus, be my Savior. And help them to know that you will. You answer that. They can do that right now in the quietness of their heart. Say it to you, Lord, save me. Come into my life. I want my sins forgiven. I want to know that when I die, I'm going to heaven. I want to have a right relationship with you, Lord. And Lord, just for the rest of us, may our lives be full of worship, be what it's all about. May our church be a house of worship, a place of great praise and honoring of you. We love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and we'll finish up with one last song.